the institutions that are um, uh, fun, uh, funding my PhD. Uh, so today I'm going to, to oh sorry I misprint that <laughs> I just realized that because I'm going to recycle this talk for next week so <laughs> that's a uh, spoiler. Uh, so um, on this talk I'm first of all I'm going to spend some time on talking on some preliminaries so free objects in general and then I'm going to talk about uh, by dual spaces, which are a special case, a particular case of free objects and free banner lattices that David has already talked about then and Pedro will, I assume he will um, talk uh, a little bit else about this in his talk. And then I'm going to go to the main topics of this talk, which will, which will be comparing the, first of all, comparing these two free objects. So the um, we will study the free peak convex mag lattice generated by a, a bidual space, and we will compare it with the bidual space of a um, free peak convex mag lattice. Um, in the last part of the talk, I will I will introduce some new notion of free objects in a category of dual banach lattices, and we will see um, how the construction goes. So, first of all, what's a free object? Um, throughout this talk, um, D will be a big category, uh, a category, and C will be a subcategory, a small category. The way I will always put it, the bigger category in blue and the smaller one in red. Um, given an object in D, a free object over A in the category C will be a pair formed by, um, by an object in the smaller category C, which we denote FA, for example, and a an morphism J from A to FA. Such, a, such that for any other object B in the category C, an amorphism from A to B, seeing here we are seeing B as, a, as, a, on, as an object in, the, in D, in the, in the bigger category, uh, we can always extend uniquely this uh, morphism to the um, to a morphism in the category C, in the smaller category. So take, for example, um, free group, a free group over a set. Here we will have a... Um, that given a certain set, we will get a, a free group over, over this set, such that any application from the set into a group will extend to a group of morphism. Okay, so we go back. This will, this will just be a, an application from the set into the group, and this will be a group of morphism. So we are gaining kind of some new proper, uh, we are gaining regularity, if you want, in this extension. So, as I said, an example is free groups. Another example is the free Banach space over a set. Uh, this is L1 of this set in this in the following sense. If we have an application from a set into a, a bounded application to a set from a set into a Banach space, then we can extend it linearly to uh, the whole L1 over this set, and we are preserving the norm of the of this uh, bounded application. We can also we. We also have the stone check compactification over a topological space, and in general, completions can be seen as a as a particular case of free objects. Um, in the more in the in the setting of functional analysis, we have, for example, Lipschitz free Banach Lipschitz free Banach spaces or metric spaces. Here, our categories are metric spaces with Lipschitz applications, um, Banach spaces with linear bounded morphisms, which are a subcategory of this one. Um, and we can continue so. Uh, with defi defining more free objects, for example, rings, uh, poly polynomial rings over a certain set, free vector lattices, etc. So now let's talk a little bit about bidual spaces, which can be seen as free objects in the category of dual Banach spaces with uh, morphisms. Our, our morphisms here will be uh, linear and bounded operators, which are also adjoint operators. If you want weak star to weak star continuous operators. Um, so in this setting, uh, we can give an Banach space E. It's by dual together with the canonical inclusion. I will always denote that, like this, the canonical inclusion of the of an of an space into its by dual. Um, it can be seen as a free uh, as a free dual free dual Banach space um, by doing this construction. Okay, so we start with our operator from our Banach space E into our dual Banach space E F star any uh, dual dual Banach space E F star. And we take the double adjoint of this one. Okay, so we go to the respective biduals. And then, since F star is a dual, we can consider the adjoint operator of the canonical inclusion of, of its pre dual, JF. So it's adjoint 
becomes a, a quotient from the by dual of f star into f star. So this composition is now a um, linear bundle operator, of course, and also a join. It's, it's an adjoint operator. So it's a morphism of, of our uh, category of the urbanic spaces. And this extension, uh, it's unique because this operator here is weak star dense, has a weak star dense range. So um, and we have the, um, it satisfies the universal property with the additional, um, with this additional thing that is that uh, the norms are, are the same, the, the extension is isometrical. So um, what else? Uh, let's go now to uh, Banach lattices. So I assume that you all are familiar with Banach lattices, but anyway, let's uh, just recall the um, definition. A Banach lattice is a Banach space with a partial order, which is compatible with the linear structure, admits um, lattice operations, and the norm uh, is compatible with the lattice structure in this way. So um, um, considering Banach lattices, uh, the, the, when I mean the category Banach lattices, I mean Banach lattices with lattice homomorphisms, not positive operators, which is also a standard consideration, Banach lattices plus positive operators. But here I'm, I'm in the setting of Banach lattices plus lattice homomorphisms, which are linear, bundle, linear operators that preserves lattice operations. And in the setting of Banach lattices, they are, they are always bounded. It is out, um, it is automatic. We don't need to assume that. Um, so we can consider a particular case of Banach lattices, which is p convex Banach lattices. These are um, Banach lattices such that there exists some constant m, uh, for which we have this inequality for any uh, n elements x1 to xn with an arbitrary but finite. Um, this uh, expression here can be understood with using function calculus, but for this particular case, it is uh, it can be defined also as, as this supremum. <laughs> um, the smaller constant here, we will call it the p convexity constant of x, and we did, we will denote it by by this. So now let's go to the definition of free Banach lattices over a Banach space, which is a free object introduced by Antonio Aviles, Jose Rodriguez, and Pedro Tradacete. A few years ago, which um, the consensus uh, which go, uh, satisfied this universal property, given a Banach space and a bounded and linear operator from uh, from our Banach, our Banach space to any Banach lattice, we will able we will be able to extend it to a Banach lattice um, using this um, um, in such a way that this uh, T hat will be a lattice homomorphism, and this uh, inclusion here, this phi sub e will be a linear isometry, okay? In such a way that uh, this uh, diagram commutes and we have a, um, the extension preserves the norm. Um, if this construction was later generalized, generalized oops, sorry, was later generalized, generalized by Hector Hardon Sanchez, Neil, Neil Lotzen, uh, Mitchell Taylor, again, Pedro Tracete and Vladimir Trotsky, uh, so that it, it, could, it could cover uh, more cases. We could restrict ourselves to the subcategory of p convex Banach lattices. So it's the, the definition is essentially the same. The only changes here are, here are the, just that we are considered um, operators from the, our Banach space into a p convex Banach lattice. This free object will be a p convex Banach lattice with p convexity constant one. Um, we need to, in uh, our extension, will no longer be preserved the norm, but will be bounded by this by this p convexity constant at the norm of the original operator. So now that every Banach lattice with, um, in the case p equals one, every Banach lattice is, is one convex. This is just a consequence of the triangular inequality and the, p -convexity, the one convexity constant will always be one. So when we put here p equals one, we are just talking of the free Banach lattice that I defined in the previous slide. So from now on, uh, when I say free Banach lattices, I'm referring to this general setting, okay, um, especially, the free Banach lattice, uh, the, the p equals one case. <laughs> so um, now that uh, that we uh, are familiar with this, let's take a look at uh, the construction because this object that is defined in a rather abstract way um, turns out to it, it exists and is essentially unique. Up to up to lattice isomorphism, let's take a look at the construction. So. <laughs> 
we consider the space of positive homogeneous function over the dual of our Banach space, and we define this norm, which is a supremum of some kind of, of some p sums. Okay, it doesn't really matter the expression. Um, and we take the set of all uh, functions which has a finite p norm, uh, and equip with with the um, we endow it with the lattice, uh, with the pointwise point order and lattice operation. Okay, in every x star, we we say that a function is positive is if it is positive in every x star. This turns out to be a Banach lattice. We can define this uh, this linear isometry, which sends every x to the evaluation map on the x stars of of the dual. And um, if we take the smaller sub the sub lattice generated by the image of this operator. And we take the norm close, the closure under under uh, under this norm. We obtain a representation after it can be shown that this Banach lattice is a representation of the free p convex Banach lattice over E. So um, now let's um, let's go to the um, to the work that um, that we've been developing these past months, which is studying the relation between free Banach lattices and free duals. Let's say by duals. Um, why this? Because duality kind behaves relatively well in with Banach lattices. For example, if we have a Banach lattice, its dual, and thus it's by dual also, is again a Banach lattice. If we start with a p convex Banach lattice, its by dual is also a p convex Banach lattice, and um, we preserve the p convexity constant. But um, it is not the, a perfect relation because, for example, it remains open if uh, every dual Banach lattice, uh, that, that is a dual Banach space which admits a lattice, a lattice structure, it is open if uh, it should have a pre dual which is also a Banach lattice. It is not known already, it's not for the separable case, but not in general. So, with this, um, with this in mind, what we have done in this, um, in this work is to study the interplay between these two constructions. So taking the free p convex Banach lattice and taking the free dual, let's see how these two operations interact. And we have also tried to define a new free object in, a, in some categories of dual Banach lattices. So let's go with the first part. Um, so consider this diagram. We have uh, our canonical embedding from our Banach space into the free p convex Banach lattice over this Banach space which is phi sub e, and we can take the double adjoint of this operator so that we lift it to the biduals. Um, now we have a Banach space, a p-convex Banach lattice, so we can extend this operator as a lattice homomorphism from the free p-convex Banach lattice over the bidual into the bidual of the free p-convex Banach lattice. This is a, line, a linear embedding, so this one is also a linear embedding, the, 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 adjoint, the, the double adjoint. So the question is, what happens with this operator? Is this, is this an embedding of what, what can we say about this? And the answer is that it is, again, an isometric lattice, because this was a lattice homomorphism, an isometric lattice embedding. How do we see that? Well, the key tool here is the principle of local reflexivity. This is a classical result that asserts, uh, that allow, allow us to see in a certain way, a finite, finite uh, dimensional subspaces of, the, of a bidual space, uh, it allows us to see them almost as, almost isometrically as subspaces of our original Banach space F, okay, in a certain way. So this um, this result, uh, together with some calculations that I'm trying to I'm, I'm going to try to uh, explain a little bit now, is what leads to the to the previous result. So this is just the slide the, um, that I mentioned before about the construction of the free p convex Banach lattice. Um, I'm going to replace, I'm going to study what happens when we have a dual Banach space instead of, of a general Banach space. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to change E by a dual space. This is uh, the same uh, slide, changing A by E star and E star by E double star, etc. And now look that we have here uh, functions defined over a by dual space. And um, inside every dual space, we have a canonical copy of the of our original original space of the pre-dual in this case. So, what happens if we restrict them, and we define a space which is defined it's, uh, uh, exactly in the same way, but 
with functions defined over E instead of E double star. Um, we can define another uh, isometry, which is just the formal inclusion from E star into HP prime. Is the formal inclusion because every element of here is a, a positively homogeneous function over E. And it turns out that um, the sublat the close sublat is generated by this operator, by the image of this operator, is a lattice isometrical to uh, the free p convex Banach lattice over E star. The idea of the proof goes by using this composition operator, which can be defined in the whole HP of E star, which is just composing with J sub E, um, the canonical inclusion into the by dua. Um, using local uh, uh, the principle of local reflexivity on some computations, it can be shown that this norm, which is the norm if in HP of E, is equal to um, the norm of F restricted to the canonical copy of E. So what we have gained here is that instead of computing with all the elements of the bidual, we can restrict ourselves to compute with all the elements in the pre-dual in, in E. So we have reduced our space of work so that with local reflexivity, uh, so that now the computations are much easier and allow us to conclude that this operator is an isometric lattice embedding. <coughs> so um, in other words, the free p convex Banach lattice generated by the free dual over a bank space embeds lattice isometrically into the free dual over the free p convex Banach lattice generated by a Banach space E. Looks a little bit like a twist tongue, but um, now let's go to the third part, the last part of the talk, which is studying free dual Banach lattices. Now we will be interested in combining these notions, free duals and free convex Banach lattices. Um, so we need to define our working category here, which will be um, Banach lattices, which are duals of some other Banach lattice and which happens to be also be convex. Okay. I explicitly put here duals of some other Banach lattices because we don't know already, we, we don't know yet if uh, every dual Banach lattice is the dual of a Banach lattice. So I need to specify that we are taking the, the, the dual of a Banach lattice. Um, with this, uh, we have two questions. First of all, can we define a free object in the same fashion as before? Um, if so, can we give an explicit construction as we did with the free p-convex Banach lattice? So we have some partial answers. We have some total answers to some cases and partial answers to the others. This is the definition. Here, um, the only changes are that our extension now will be a weak star to weak star continuous at this amorphism and a joint operator because we are working in a category of dual Banach spaces, Banach lattices in this case. Um, again, this uh, extension, uh, the norm of this extension is bounded by the p convexity constant and the norm of the operator. So with this um, in mind, in the case P greater than one, the answer is that the natural candidate, which is the double, the bidual of the free becomes Banach lattice satisfies this definition, okay? How does the proof go? It's um, quite simple, let's say. Uh, if we start with um, a P convex dual Banach lattice, um, dual of some Banach lattice X, then, it follows that it's pre-dual must be P star concave. That's not really matter. If you don't know what's, what uh, Q, Q concavity is, it doesn't really matter. The only important thing now is that it implies order continuity of the pre-dual. So uh, order continuity, one of its many characterizations is that it is equivalent to the canonical embedding from, from the space into the bidual uh, being interval preserving, okay? Interval preserving and lattice morphisms are dual are dual notions. So this means that uh, the dual of uh, the, the adjoint of uh, the canonical inclusion will be a lattice homomorphism co co quotient. So we can draw this diagram. We start with E, our operator that we want to extend into a dual Banach space, dual Banach lattice, sorry, and we extend it to the free p convex Banach lattice as a lattice homomorphism. This extension is unique. Then we lift it to the biduals of the of each space. And then we go back, we, don't, we, we, we go down with the adjoint of this inclusion, which will be a lattice homomorphism and an adjoint operator. So this extension, uh, it is now a morphism in our, in our categories. It is, uh, we start to be continuous, and it is also a lattice homomorphism. 
So, and it's, it is the unique extension because this is the unique lattice morphism, the extension, and this one here has weak star dense range. So we, we conclude that this, this space satisfies the, our definition. So it must be essentially the free, uh, the free dual peak convex planar lattice. And what happens with the case P equals one? Well, this proof does no longer work because we, we, because we have a Banach lati dual Banach lattices, which are mm, whose uh, order continuous are not, uh, sorry, whose uh, pre-duals are not order continuous. So, for example, the dual of C of zero one, the measures, the border measures over C of zero or C over zero one, um, C, C of zero one is not order continuous, so we cannot apply this trick here. Um, in fact, we know that this the natural candidate, the free by dual, the, the by dual over the free Banach lattice over E satisfies this definition of free dual Banach lattice if and only if E does not contain any complemented copy of L1. So we know that if we are working with L1 of, an, of a space that contains L1 complemently, complementably, then um, this space no longer satisfies the definition. So now the question that remains open and we are working on it is whether uh, this object can be defined, can be constructed for uh, for this this case when it contains a complemented copy of L1. We know that the natural candidate won't do it, but we don't know yet if we can construct another different space of it, if it, it cannot be defined at all. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Um, here you have some reference in case you are you are interested. Uh, you mentioned that interval preserving and lattice homomorphisms are dual. Does it, do you know if it goes both ways? Yes. So you have, um, oh, sorry. I think you. <laughs> so yeah, and then um, usually the main reference I use uh, when working with this uh, result uh, probably it's done. It has been done before, but in the book of Meyer Niebuhr, in section one point four, there's, there's, there's this result that says that. An operator is uh, almost interval preserving if and only if its adjoint is, an, is a lattice morphism, and an operator is a lattice morphism if and only if its adjoint is interval preserving, if I'm not mistaken. So it goes both ways. Yeah, section 1.4, theorem 19, I think. <laughs> Sorry, just 19, yeah. Thank you for your talk. Uh, my question is, have you ever uh, think about uh, the relation between uh, properties of uh, A and uh, the free balance lattice uh, over A? Yeah. If, the, if this free balance lattice exists. Yeah, so, so you are, um, you, are um, you mean the free Banach lattice or the free dual Banach lattice? So, okay. Okay, so the free Banach lattice over E, it was, um, it has already been done by, well, and it's still a work in progress because there are much properties that are maybe interested to think about, but uh, the, for the free Banach lattice, um, there are some kind of dictionary between properties, Banach space properties of E and Banach lattice property of, properties of free Banach lattice of E. Um, you can see, for example, the, a memoir that it's, uh, it's, it's already on, on archive. It has been sent by Pedro Trafete, Mitchell Taylor, Timur Ogber, and Vladimir Troitsky. Um, the, here, the, in this work, they study a lot of uh, properties of free Banach lattices. And in particular, they, yeah, they conclude, for example, that um, finite dimensional is finite dimensional if and only if this free Banach lattice has uh, a strong order unit. It is separable if and only if the free Banach lattice has a um, was interior point. You have complemented, complemented copies of L1 if and only if uh, this free Banach lattice contains an, a subspace as a lattice isomorphic to L1 and so many other characterizations. So there, um, this is a work in progress, but it's we're kind of building up dictionary between Banach space properties and Banach lattice properties. I don't know, Pedro, are you going to talk about this in your talk? 
Okay, so I make a little bit of a spoiler. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, any other question? Another question is uh, uh, about uh, the uh, factorization problem. Problems. Uh, I mean that, uh, for example, if we take uh, another other weakly compact operators, we see that this uh, this uh, uh, this operators can be factorized factorized by uh, uh, another continuous norm, a Banach lattice in general. I don't know. Look, uh, can uh, can we? Find some uh, factorization using this free bar free bar yeah. we, we work on this problem in a few months a few months ago. We are planning to go over it eventually. But if I'm not mistaken, I'm doing it. I, I'm saying it by heart, so I'm not complete hundred percent sure. But um, okay, let me look about the definition. Yeah, so, okay. So I think that this operator is order weakly compact. No, wait, wait, no. The adjoint of this operator is order weakly compact. If and only if the adjoint of this operator is order weakly compact, something like that, right, Pedro? And it was also equivalent so, to this operator you know, preserving some kind of copy of C0 or something like that. I think this is from Gusub Johnson and Ali Brandt. I plan to so, right. Okay. But um, I'm not, um, I don't remember the characterization right now. I can tell you because I have it uh, written in the computer. But I I would say that is this, the adjoint of this operator is order weakly compact if and only if the adjoint of this one is order weakly compact. And some other properties. Thank you very much. So let's thank Peter again. Okay, uh, I wanted to say, uh, especially for those who are online, that the program has been uh, updated. Uh, to see it, you can check the website. Thank you. So it's uh, fin over for this afternoon. At four, yeah, at four, you have to be at the.
Thank <laughs> you. 